We think of a man as being masculine, mm -hmm. but a man should be the right blend of masculine and feminine. Mm -hmm. Hey everyone, it's your girl Tolly T and welcome to the My Love Is podcast, the podcast brought to you by Bumble, the dating app that puts women firmly in control. I might take a bit of a back seat today and let the, the men talk. As a woman that dates men, it's important to have like a positive relationship with them, especially when it comes to talking about relationships, love, masculinity, femininity, and just how we engage. I've got a guest with me who is used to talking. He is a podcaster, a male podcaster, important, a male podcaster. And if you haven't guessed it yet, I am joined by the host of the Diary of a CEO, entrepreneur, also on Dragon's Den, what I like to call money man. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Butler. Hi, Stephen. How are you? Hello. Did you like the introduction as a money it. man? Yeah. If I don't hear that in an episode of yeah. The Diary of a CEO, you've let me down. Okay. I just hope you know that. Did you get that from my Bumble bio? Yeah. The money man. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Have you ever so. done um, online dating? Were you ever... We'll get into it I later have, a bit yeah. more, but like a little bit? A little bit, yeah. Okay, yeah. then cool. I've got a game that I've actually stolen from the Bumble app. It's my icebreaker and it's for us to get to like know each other a bit more. Mm -hmm. As like two podcasters, I feel like they're kind of like, you're going to want to talk. I'm going to want to talk. So I just want us to like, relax, sure. set the mood, okay. and just know each other. Like, can I call you Steve? No? Of course you can. Okay. Whatever you want. S. S, S, B, S. Okay, cool. I'll call you Stephen. Okay. <laughs> okay, first question. What is the greatest misconception about you? Um, I think people think I'm smarter than I actually am. And I think typically when you achieve things in your life, there's an assumption that you're good at a lot of things. But okay. From what I've understood from sitting there with some of the smartest people, most talented people in the world, is you only really need to be good at a very narrow amount of things. And so I think typically people think I'm smarter or more talented than I really am fundamentally. Okay, okay, what is mine? Do you know what? I have this reoccurring thing where people just genuinely think I'm not that friendly. Really? Yeah, did you get friendly vibes from me? Yes, I did. The minute I walked up, you oh, asked damn. me for a big hug. And, oh. Yeah. My face has been, I'm ruining my... People say that, people don't think you're friendly. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I, I don't think I give across friendly vibes, apparently, until you meet me, maybe on social, but very kind of like, oh, it's not good. If Let I don't see. smile, okay, wait. I understand. Do you hear it? Yeah, you see I understand it, why they think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your love language? Oh, acts of service. Same. Why do you think that is? I don't know, I, I, I cringe a little when I say it, because it sounds like I want a... A servant. A servant, <laughs> yeah. But it, I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's I can guess, but I'm not sure. Okay, my what's guess, your guess would be that because I'm incredibly busy, mm -hmm. for someone to do something small for me, you know, if I'm packing my bags, or whatever, and my my girlfriend's helped me with something, for me, that's a real sign of like we're a team and we're supporting each other, and that's like love to me. Yeah. How do you know when you really like someone? <laughs> so people think of liking someone in two ways. There's okay. the kind of surface level you know, you're a little bit giddy, you're mm -hmm. a little bit flustered, that kind of what you see in the movies. And then there's this other thing, there's this sense of calm. Okay. And the sense of calm is when I, when I know I like someone. Right. That's when you really like someone. Mm -hmm. One's like lust and maybe a factuation, you kind of fancy them. Yeah. And the other one is like, this is a deeper friendship, do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And there's a sense of calm that comes yeah. with that. So when I'm really calm about them, I think. Okay, cool. So I describe love as something that feels like home. Interesting. So I feel like I know I'm really into somewhere else like, yo, I'm happy here. And do you know that like with home, even if you're like on the best holiday and it's the nicest space, it's like, oh, I can't wait to go home now. There's the always yeah. that. If so, if I had this inkling of like, I can't wait to get back Safety to you. Yeah, that's my thing. Okay, last one. What's the soundtrack to your love life? It could be right now. It could be from Kingdom Come. Drake's doing it wrong. Okay, so I'm a huge Drake fan. So in that song, Drake basically describes the realization that he's with the wrong person. Okay. And that for, for their good, he's got to let them go. Okay. Um, Doesn't feel positive, Stephen. No, but I think that's for the last 10 years of my love life. Yeah. I've been attracted to the wrong person and eventually had to have the conversation where I've realized that I've made a mistake and that it's nothing to do with them, but I've but we've got to separate. So that song I always think of when I think of my love life over the last decade. What that was you? like a good way for you to say, it's not you, it's me. It really has been me in the sense of like, I've not known who I am to know what I want, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, yeah. What about you? Um, mine will be Janae Aiko, While We're Young. There's something about that song that feels so freeing. It's just so like... How does that relate to your love life? Because um, I don't know what's happening. Because you're it's, single. No, no, no. It's, it's um, what I'd want it to feel like. 
Oh. Yeah, I, so I live in ideals a lot. Sometimes good, sometimes not sort of thing. And I consistently want it to feel like, do you know when you're driving, you put, you stick your head out the pit yeah, window yeah, yeah. and just that breeze hits your face? Yeah. That's what the notion of what I want love to consistently feel like. And that feels like a good soundtrack to it. Nice. We have similarities. So both our parents, are both our mothers are mm -hmm. Nigerian. Mm -hmm. And so your mother is Nigerian. You were born in Botswana and your dad is English. Yes. Before we start anything, how do you identify? Um, in what regard? In terms of your race. I identify as black. Okay, cool. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure, because you know, everyone's yeah. allowed to have it's their It's actually things. an interesting question. No one's yeah. ever actually asked me that in my life. Oh, really? People Never. just assume it's... Well, when you grew up in an all-white area, mm -hmm. like Devon in 1992, yeah. um, you're black. Yeah. Because I was the only black kid in my school, other than my siblings. Mm -hmm. We had a school of, what, 1,500 kids? Okay. So I was black. I was the only thing I knew of black, other than my mum. That was the only person I knew that was even more, you know, she was, she was darker skin tone than me, but I was, I'm black. How long was you in Botswana for? Um, I think for two and a half years. Okay, cool. Because I um, lived in Nigeria from when I was about one till I was seven. Oh, really? So I was born here and then got taken to, I want to say taken back home, which is really mm. interesting because I was born here, yet I still identify it as I was taken back home. So home is Nigeria. Nigeria, which is really, really interesting. So I got taken back home and it's always so, when I talk about black love, it's mm. such a, I have to keep reminding myself that it's actually a westernized notion, right? Mm. Because where I grew up in Nigeria, we were all black. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It was just love. Yeah, yeah. Right? So yeah. it's just like, so when I came here and it's just like, oh wait, this is a thing that actually needs to be shouted about and needs to be visible. It's always very like interesting to me, mm -hmm. just how that works and how relationships work in terms of, yeah, why it's important to label it maybe black love here, but not so much at home or where I was from or where I was brought up or anything like that. Mm. Um, and I think home and our parents are such a huge impact on who we are as people. Remember when my sister was pregnant, I got her a book called How Not to F Them Up. Because I do think that's, I think that's like her kids. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like okay. Because yeah. I think yeah. that's our first example of people that are going to mess us up, not intentionally of course, but I do think it's something that leads to it. And I think many women are very open, including myself, to talk about daddy issues. Mm -hmm. Like I would say I have daddy issues and not in the kind of obvious way that, oh, then it means I just sleep around. Cause you know, it's, it's never that. My daddy issues mean I'm extremely fearful of men. You're an avoidant. Yes. Don't, don't psych me, sir. I pay, <laughs> I pay 80 quid an hour for the really? yeah. I don't need you to do it now. <laughs> so I, I do that. Do you think that's something men deal with in terms of daddy issues or mummy issues or how it affects them later? In fact, more personally, is that something you think you've ever dealt with or feels personal to you? Yeah, I think this idea of like daddy issues and mummy issues is maybe a little bit misunderstood. I think really what's happening is you're learning what love means at that age. It's the first model you have of what love is mm -hmm. and how a, a man and a woman should, or other, should be engaging. And what that's the key question, which is like, what does love mean? So when I was a kid, I learned that love means you sit there as a woman screams at you for five hours straight and you don't oh, say a word. Okay. And so I would see my dad, I remember just vividly seeing him sat there. He would say zilch and my mum would be arguing with him. And so I grew up thinking love was prison. I was convinced that when, a, when you find a romantic partner to step inside the birdcage and close the door. So I, I remember pursuing a girl when I was 12. It took me four years. Eventually, one day she turns around to me, says she's going to dump her boyfriend and be with me. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I started dissuading her to be, no, no, to be interested in me. <laughs> I felt a, a feeling in my chest mm -hmm. of, of like sickness slash horror, mm -hmm. even though I'd been pursuing her, because there you have what I'd learned about love. I, suddenly, I was the guy on the chair in jail. Okay. And so it's, I think that's a lot of it. It's like you learn the model of love and you, um, at that age and we all do. I mean, it's, it ends up defining us. And until we become cognizant of it, until we're aware, our model of love that we learn subconsciously is the puppet master behind us, making us run yeah. from love, making us find excuses, self-sabotage and all those things mm -hmm. that we do. But the key, I actually sat with a trauma expert a couple of weeks ago. He's the number one in the world. Just wrote a book on trauma. Yeah. Step one is awareness, which right, is okay. like really being super clear on exactly why yeah. you believe love is what it is. Mm -hmm. And then you can start looking at your behavior, those thoughts, how they're translating into feelings yeah. and how that's translating into behavior. So that's what I've done over the years. And that's, okay. that's meant that up until 25, I hadn't had a girlfriend. Okay, I've was, got loads of questions okay. about that. When you talk about trauma, I mean, okay. if you think back to that situation now where you're watching your parents argue, right? And yeah. you feel like your mum's just having an argument with your dad yeah. who was just sat there and not yeah. saying anything. In your eyes now as a grown adult man, who do you think was doing something bad? Or who did you think was doing something bad? Um, so in the moment, I would think that my mother was in the wrong. What I actually have come to learn, because I've I now understand 
what conflict resolution is and how it's integral to a healthy relationship yeah. is they had a conflict resolution issue. I, I always say that you can tell the long-term health of a relationship by whether each cut, each argument, or each conflict heals to 99% or 101%, right. i.e. does your conflict make you stronger? And in order for it to make you stronger, you have to be a master of communication. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody wants to be heard and understood. Yeah. Now, the reason why my mum would scream for five hours, and some, my dad, I remember dad, my dad leaving the house. My mum did realise she, mm -hmm. she was in a different room. He thinking. goes, does his errands, comes back in like, hours later, and she doesn't, has no idea he left. Mm -hmm. And she's been having, a, she doesn't feel understood or, or heard. Yeah. Had my dad said to her, can I just be, can I just be clear, um, Esther? Just want to be clear. The issue is this, this, yeah, and yeah, this. Yeah. And you feel that way because I've done this. Mm -hmm. And you think that the, the, the argument probably would have lasted a couple of minutes. Yeah. But he didn't know how to make her feel heard and understood, and she didn't feel heard and understood. So it was a record. It was a broken record. Just kept going back and forth. Because yeah. when you tell me that story instantly, and I think maybe because of how I'm wired and knowing that your mum is a black woman, I sided with her. I was like, yeah, what? Yeah. She's trying to talk to you. Why are you not saying anything back? It feels almost, because I think one of the worst things someone can do to me personally is silent treatment. It feels 100%. so wicked and evil, right? Like, yo, talk back to me. So the, the interesting thing there is my mum had learned a form of communication and conflict resolution. My dad spoke a different language as it relates to communication and conflict resolution. Okay. So from being watching that as a young kid, I learned that when someone starts arguing with mm -hmm. you, if they raise their voice, you leave. Right, okay. you can, And as you said, you know how frustrating that yeah. is. So up in, for the first 25 years of my life, yeah. because of my early experience, when I was with someone, and they said something to me and then they just carried on going and carried on going. And then they started like getting, if the volume goes up, mm -hmm. I would be out. out. I don't care the time of night. Yeah. 3 a.m. I'm in the car mm -hmm. and I'm driving. Yeah. You know, or I'm in the wardrobe. And, yeah. But I'm avoidant. I don't want to argue. But I'm avoidant. You're, and you're an avoidant. But you, but you, you said you, you. No, you called me avoidant earlier. I mean, I would stay and argue. Oh, so <laughs> this is slightly different, right? Like, okay. As an attachment style, we can say communication styles and attachment yeah. styles. Your attachment style is an avoidant. Yeah but your communication style mm -hmm. is someone who would want to kind of confront the issue yeah, and resolve it now. Yeah. And you'd want to feel heard and understood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know what, can you tell everyone what are the attributes of being a secure and what are the attributes of being avoidant? Just so like everyone knows. Yeah, an avoidant is someone who, when confronted with the prospect of romantic love, they typically avoid it in some way. They run from it, they'll make an excuse, they'll find a reason why it's not going to work, they'll self-sabotage, yeah. that kind of thing. A secure is, pretty much the opposite. Mm -hmm. There's someone that understands um, healthy affection. They're able to make long lasting, deep romantic connections with people. In conflict resolution, they seem yeah. to be very, very good at resolving things. They have sort of a deep friendship with their partner usually. And that middle one, yeah. the anxious attachment style, is characterized by being basically a bit needy. Yeah. Needing so, reassurance. You know, that's my worst trait in a human being, neediness. Well, so it is because you're an avoidant. It so an anxious, me who wants, needs reassurance yeah. and has sort of a abandonment complexes and an avoidant who wants to run away. It's yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? You want to run and they, they need it's more like, quality tell me, time. Tell me, yeah. So my girlfriend is, a, is an anxious. She, okay. she needs reassurance and quality time and those things. And I'm, a, I'm an avoidant. So we've had to, that's why most of our conflict is about, I want more quality time and mine's, I want more freedom. <laughs> right, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I yeah. think that links back to my feeling saying that I want love to feel like freedom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we kind of go, go you head out the window. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm in this, but I can go out whenever exactly, I want. Yeah. And also, I guess it makes sense when you talk about, going back to you talking about the argument between your parents, watching your dad and feeling like he was like trapped. Yeah. Like, yo, get up or yeah. <laughs> do something. I think he was just shouting at him. I think he like, was okay. secure. I think my mum was maybe, maybe an anxious. And um, yeah. Okay, so seeing how your parents interacted yeah. clearly affected your future relationships. Oh, I mean, it defined it. But yet you wouldn't call it daddy or mummy issues in any way, shape or form? No, because it's, it's both of them. It's the model of both of them and how they engaged. And okay. what, what that taught me about when, it, when I met a woman, I'm basically meeting, in my sort of subconscious mind, my mother. Okay. You know, in, in many respects. And especially if that person then demonstrates behaviours that you saw at home, mm -hmm. you've learned how defence mechanisms to avoid the psychological discomfort associated with that, which for me meant if the vo volume goes up, you leave. I've never argued with anybody in my life in terms of a romantic partner. Yeah. I've never shouted, I've never raised my voice ever. It's always this, okay. this tone. And if they go up, I go. That's what it was. Oh, I've right, learned okay, now, so okay. that doesn't happen anymore. Because like you said, trauma, you have to be aware of it, right? This is the thing I'm dealing with yeah. because of this thing that's happened. Yeah. You've identified it, you're aware of it. What now? Yeah. So the first thing that's really helped me is the awareness point meant that I communicated with my partner now, mm -hmm. my, my, my childhood. Yeah. So she knows exactly. Right, okay. And then um, 
it's, it's learning how to communicate. So if you, if you had an issue with me, the first mm -hmm. thing I would do was I try and confront it as soon as possible. So I could say, I know something's wrong. Can we talk about it? Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes women don't want to talk they about it just yet. About, yeah. They just want to give you the eye. They want mm -hmm. to be this, you know, the stush thing where it's like, oh, nothing's wrong. Yeah. You know, and that you roll, and, but they're pissed off at you mm -hmm. because you can see it. Yeah. So I try and broker the conversation as loud as I can. And then when they give me stuff, I listen. Right, okay. And I like really listen. Okay. Really, really, really listen. To the point where it's a, it's, it looks a little bit suspicious. And then once I feel like it's the right time, I will repeat back to you what I think I heard. Right, okay. And that's usually when the other person feels heard and understood. Mm -hmm. And then I'll try and speak. And if I try and speak and then there's an interjection, yeah. I'll ask for the space to speak. And Does remind that you that. nuance though? Because I feel like in the perfect world, right, that's how the argument would go. Hey, honey, are you okay? No, you've done this. Like, it doesn't allow nuance. It doesn't allow emotion. It and does allow emotion. There's always emotion. Think? Oh, there's always tears. Because even how you're explaining it to me now feels very like, yo. Because we're not arguing with, with each other. Yeah. But imagine there was something that you were really upset about. Uh -huh. There would be tears. Yeah, of course. And so that there's, I think, 80% of the time that I've had these conversations with my, with my partner, there is a real outpouring of tears. There's okay. a real outpouring of honesty. Mm -hmm. And I really try and stay away from blame as much as I can, which is sometimes difficult. But I, if I say something, I'll try and frame it as like, this is how it's made me feel okay. versus you've done this to me. Okay. And I'm, I've come to learn, and this all sounds a bit poxy and like, you know, it's a and, but you can predict the long-term health of relationship by how you deal with conflict resolution. I think that as well, that's true. I've, I, so to stop there being a buildup of contempt and resentment, which is the single biggest killer of uh, marriages, it's the single thing that leads to divorce most, you've got to address it. You've right. got to know how to resolve conflict. Because if it, we don't resolve it, it becomes contempt. Yeah, of course. So I would rather just tough it out today yeah. so we can move on together. And that's why you need to learn the skill of conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we don't get taught it. So we learn it in movies. Ah, you know, yeah, of course, just, yeah. It's... And also what we see, it's never like, I think as much as I'm like, oh, our parents have done this or whatever, they only knew what they knew, right? Yeah. Like, as in, we've had the, the luxury of being able to read and talk to different yeah. people. They spoke to the same circle. They saw how it maneuvered with their parents. And that's just what they knew yep. to do sort of thing. And so when I think about how to have relationships, right, like how to be in a relationship with a man, it feels so foreign to me because no men lived in my house. My mum did the most adorable thing where she used to buy mugs that read, I love dad. My dad's never lived with us. But it was just kind of like, so you don't feel left out. <laughs> so she used to buy the mugs that say, I love dad, just to kind of be like, maybe if other people come into the home, it feels like there was someone like, there was a dad figure there and there kind of never was. And I think that's kind of shows up in my relationships in so many different ways with the men. I am great at keeping a male friend. I can be your friend to kingdom come. Like we can be the best of friends. We can be, we can talk deeply. But what it means is that I kind of make you like, sexually, I'm just like, don't see it. Like, don't see it at all. Like, you kind of just become like a lamp. Look <laughs> of a better face, you're just my mate. Okay. And that's kind of because of the lack of having to deal with men in that world, or even seeing romantic relationships in my home. What do you like with intimacy? I mean, when I'm, I'm talking about touch and affection and yeah. I love you. And so in my like acts of service list, it's the right at the bottom. If a guy says to you, do you know what, I love you. I can say I love you back. Yeah, but do you feel, I mean it, do you, yeah. you don't cringe or anything? You don't... No, I don't like corny though. Okay. Like, just say I love you really, and then I have to start comparing me to roses. Okay. Yeah, like, just kind of like straight down. The, you are trying to psych me so much, but it's fine. Yeah, it's I, fine, I, I can I, see it. It's not even me, it's just what I do. It's just, yeah, I can I'm, see what, it. I'm naturally curious about psychology and trauma and the way that our early upbringing impacts us. I actually did childhood psychology when I was in GCSEs and I just find it really interesting. Okay, then That's cool. why the Diary of a CEO is the way it is as well. Yeah, because it starts all the time with, with like, okay, the, tell me about your childhood. Your context, yeah. Yeah. Did you ever talk to your dad about relationships and love? Never. Did you ever talk to your friends, your guys, my, or anything my, like that? Yeah, all my guy friends. We all talk about it all the time. Right, okay, but I'll, never to your dad? Never to my dad, no. Why is that? I, I just, I learned so much about love after I'd left home. I learned when I was like 23, 24, and me and my dad don't have those kind of conversations these days. It's more just kind of, you good? Yeah, you good? Yeah, you know, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with my boys, with my, with my male friends, all the time. Would you have it with your mum? No. Why? We still struggle to communicate, I think, a little bit. When we communicate, it doesn't seem to be about those type of topics. It's more, it's more, more current affairs, right, okay. I'd say, than okay. like, psychology or things things a little bit more deeper my mum kind of quite similarly like left school early came here yeah. to england to like make it and i always say i'm like i am my immigrant mum's dream 
Yeah. Like, this is what she came here for. Exactly. Like, as in, oh, oh, everything feels worth it because how I get to live life and what I get to show her. But I think there was just this innate need for us. Like, hey, my kids need to make it. Mm. Like, everything I've been through needs to be worth it. Yeah. And I think maybe similarly, that's probably what your mum went through. To be like, this needs to be worth it. Yeah, I just saw her doing it. I just couldn't understand why she worked all the time, why she worked so hard. Yeah. Like, it was like she was fighting for her life the way she worked. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then so you, I kind of... What was she? Um... I almost believe, I almost think that she was taught that you have to fight for your life yeah. in terms of work. Mm -hmm. So you just have to work all the time. Mm -hmm. That's what she did. And even when she could not have, because my dad had this, he had a fairly good job and she could have just stayed at home or she could have gone and done something else. But she chose, she's always chosen, even to this day, what I called her on the weekend and I'm like, I will buy you a place to live in London. Mm -hmm. If you, she said she wanted to travel around the world, you can travel around the world, I'll pay for it. Yeah. You want a house, a car, whatever, I'll pay for it. She declines it all. Mm -hmm because she still wants to work and build build businesses and stuff. Right, okay. She declines like all of the things that I give her to just to have an easy life yeah. because her default is to like fight mm -hmm. and to work every day. Yeah. And I used to see her in her corner shop. She'd sleep in the back room because the people were breaking in and racially abusing her. So she'd sleep on this bag of rice in the back room. And then she stopped coming home because she was just sleeping in there. Yeah. She was then she had this restaurant. So she was going between her restaurants. She was running in this corner shop and both of them then go bust. She starts another corner shop and it's just, she start, must have started 25 businesses in 25 years. So I've listened to you talk about how you work. Yeah. Before in the past, maybe you're better at it now. That doesn't sound too far to how you work. Yeah, I think she definitely taught me the important, she showed, she showed me hard work to the point where as kids growing up, we were just always working. Mm -hmm. We were always working on something, like in one of the houses, you know, I remember her giving me a knife and saying, scrape all the paint off all these walls. I'm seven, I find, right? <laughs> You're gonna, I'm gonna get a pound when I do one when wall. So I'm yeah. like, I'm gonna get this wall done. You know, mm -hmm. so we were always working growing up as kids. But I think the thing that made me hardworking was actually the context in which I lived, we were the poorest family. So when I said her businesses failed, yeah. I mean like, I watched my mum stand in the street with p police officers there as they tried to repossess her, her restaurant and she wouldn't, she wouldn't give it up. Mm. And she ends up in a prison cell that night. Like we were, we were in tremendous financial hardship the whole time. I thought we were bankrupt for pretty much my whole childhood. Mm -hmm. And this goes to where my hard work comes from. I'm the only black kid in an all-white area in Devon. Yeah. Our house is smashed to pieces. My brother's windows on the, facing the street were smashed for 15 years. We, but we live in a nice neighborhood. Yeah. And Chris Rock has that quote where he says, like, we were poor enough to grow up uh, broke in a middle-class area. It's like, that was my life. Six foot high grass out the front. My neighbor's perfect white household. I went to my mum's house the other day and I was like, why? Look at everyone else's house. Like, yeah, why are you bad. living like this? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd be like, Mum, I'm going to give you money to sort it out. I'll come back the next week. Yeah. She's used the money for something else. And yeah. it's just still the grass. It's yeah. just like that. It, it was, so I never brought anybody back, including a girl back in the 18 years or 16 years that I lived in the Southwest. Okay. And then you have this absence of my parents because they're always out. My mum's sleeping at the shop. And when my dad finishes his job, he goes to the shop mm -hmm. or he goes to the restaurant. So I'm 10. And I'm, I'm in the context I'm in, I'm feeling shame yeah. and insecurity. I want to be white and rich mm -hmm. because everyone else is white and rich yeah. and we are, we are not. Um, and I have this void of independence, which says, if you're going to have anything, it's going to come from your own actions. I start selling stuff. That's when I become an entrepreneur. I just, you know, I thought money was everything in life. I thought, I thought if I get money, then I get total happiness. So yeah. what my best friend said to me when, when I was younger, Joe, he said, he said, you're so hungry mm -hmm. that this can go one or two ways for you. And I know exactly what he meant. Yeah, absolutely. Because my whole orientation was, I need to make it. I need to become a millionaire. I need to be, that was my orientation. At 18, the front page of my diary, bear in mind, I'm living in Moss Side. Yeah. It says, I'll, uh, a million pounds before I'm 25, a Range Rover Sport will be my first car. I'll get a six pack and I'll have a long-term relationship with a woman. Those are my four goals in life. And I always said, before, goals before I'm 25. That's why my book is called Happy Sexy Millionaire, because I was trying it. Did that you was make it. Them? Before I was 20, 23 years old, became a millionaire. Range Rover Sport was the first car I ever drove. It was the, after I passed my driving test at 23, I had a long-term relationship with a girl. Six pack and debatable. How about now? But I, sorry? You still working on the six pack now? Or it well, I'm, I'm in better shape now, but it was more because I was such a, I was such, I had two huge brothers. I was such a small little kid. So okay. I just wanted to have some mass, I think. So, yeah. So was there anything you felt that was like good that you saw from their relationship? Anything from your parents' yeah. relationship that you wanted to take from and learn from? Yeah. What one, would you say that was? One of the most Im important things I ever saw, and I didn't realise it until I was an adult, was even in the heat of their arguments, if my mum asked my dad for something, he'd go do it. Ah, oh, okay. There was always love there somehow. There was always, so they could be, you know, arguing with each other, whatever, whatever, whatever. You know, you'd think these two people hated each other. Mm -hmm. And then my mum might go, hey, could you go 
changed the channel for me and he'd go, yep. Yeah. Or he'd go make her a cup of tea. Yeah. And it was this like, okay, you know, so there was this overall, and he would go, so for example, he would drive her around a lot because she couldn't drive. So even in those moments, if she wanted to go somewhere in the car, he would just straight away, no questions asked. He would never hold anything against her. It was like, it was like the argument was, I don't know, above, but the foundation was like, I love you and I made a commitment to care about you and the kids. So yeah. I'm always going to put that, regardless of what we're arguing about, that always comes first. And so in my own relationships now, I've, I've held on to that, which is like, as a man, I feel like my job is to take care of you irrespective okay. of whether, what we're arguing about, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's all secondary to like the foundation. Yeah. I love that you said as a man, because I wanted to kind of talk to you about gender roles. Yeah. And I think that as a man thing comes up a lot. And I always say this and it's people find it really interesting, especially when it comes to like family and being with a man. And I think, again, it's how I was brought up. Like I am very much brought up as a Nigerian woman, right? Yeah. As in like I was like reared to be a wife. Yeah. <laughs> like like <laughs> yeah. when my mum could, it was come to the kitchen, yeah. come and know how to do this. That like, gender roles were very, very yeah. performed in my home. Yeah. How do you define gender roles? Do you know what? I, I don't think about it like that. I just have my own perception of what I want to be as a man. Okay. And that's how I lead. So for me, me being a man is I, I want to take care of my partner. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to, I, you know, we think of a man as being masculine, mm -hmm. but a man should be the right blend of masculine and feminine. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by, like, hopefully I can be as caring and as thoughtful and as emotional and as affectionate and as, you know, wonderful as the women in my life have always been to me, while also being strong and caring and a provider to you, which for me, I'm a, I'm a bit, is the term chivalrous? In the yeah. sense of like, I'd, op I'd always open the door. I think I should pull the chair out. I should pay for everything. I've always, even when I was broke, yeah. When I was really broke, broke, mm -hmm. like, you know, broke, <laughs> like, bailiff, like, CCJs. Yeah. yeah. If I went on a date, even though I'd, I remember one time going on a date in London, I had 100 quid to my name. I spent the whole 100 quid on a date, walked back. Because, and I walked, and I didn't know London at the time, so I walked for about three hours oh, through some so tunnel. Like good money-saving decision. But I just, it just shows, like, I would always pay, even if, like, I wouldn't take you on a date if I wouldn't pay. Yeah. So, I mean, I like that. I still, I still stand by that. And I've got a very toxic thing that I say out loud, and it's... <laughs> If we talk about money and relationships, I've always said, I was like, I want to earn a lot of money. I want to do great and be very successful, but I want my partner to earn more than me. And that was always because I was like, I cannot be bothered to deal with the fragility of what it might bring up if he doesn't. Interesting. I, just, I can't be asked. Yeah. I can't be asked to like, be like, it's okay, babe. I'll like, and then you yeah. feel away because I covered something. And I was just like, I just, I've never wanted that. And like I referred to you earlier as money man. Mm. How did... Does it show up in your relationship since you have been successful? And yeah. has it changed who you look for and how you do? Yeah, it definitely has. So I'm very fortunate now that my girlfriend, and when I say this, I mean this, and I've got people in this room now that know her, does not care about my money at all. Okay. To the point like, we'll go to a nice hotel. She, she'll want to stay at the bad one. She'll want to stay down the, at the hut down the road. I mean, she... I'll do the exact same if I was dating you because it makes me look good. No, no, no. no I've seen that <laughs> game play out as well. And, and I've seen that, oh, no, I don't care. And yeah. then, you know, da, da. no, she like legit doesn't care. Okay. She grew up on a farm in Bordeaux. She drives a Citroen Saxo and drives her brother to school every day. Right. She cares about like plants and trees and spirituality and mm -hmm. stuff like that. How long have you been together for? We had, a, there was a gap in between, but um, three years. Okay, yeah. I think she's legit. Because by a year and a half, your true colours start showing. Well, you meet the family as well. Yeah. And the family are just the purest set of human beings you've ever met in your life. And the, the little brother, who is just the purest human being you've ever met in your life. And what they care about, they like, they have a farm, they like pick tomatoes out yeah. the ground. They're not about that life. And I'm lucky in my relationship because, you know, they say distance makes the heart grow fonder, yeah. whatever they say. Time makes the heart grow fonder, whatever. My girlfriend has lived in on the opposite side of the world for the last year. Okay. And then even now she's moved to London, which is the first time we've lived together. Okay. She's gone every week doing her own little, oh, right. doing her own breathwork sessions and whatever in Paris. And then she went to Bordeaux. And then she texted me yesterday. She's like coming back this week, but then she's like, I'm gonna go to India for two weeks and do some classes there. So I have, as an avoidant, yeah. I have my freedom, oh, that's great. you know? And then when I see her, when I actually, I went to Paris like last week to see her just for a day. Yeah. And it was great. And yeah. we went on a day and it was like new again, Yeah. you know? So I think that's important. <laughs> Are you romantic? Because there is that great story, I'm going to let you tell it. Uh-oh. Where you went to go get your girl back. Oh yeah, that's her. That, yeah. yeah. So tell us a great story, because it sounds like something out of a rom-com. Yeah, it is a rom-com. I write, so if you ever want it made into a TV show. Story. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> Note it down. What's the okay. story? How did it go? 
So this is interesting because, and there's, there's a big point here, especially for men, mm -hmm. I think. One day, a couple, several months into our relationship, she turned around to me and said, I don't like having sex. Ah. And as a man, I, it, I, I go, well, this is, I, I think as a man, sometimes it can, it can feel that sentence when a woman doesn't like having, says she doesn't like having sex, can feel quite perplexing. It can feel emasculating. You think, is it me? I don't know, I'm yeah. hearing it wrong, I don't know, you know, whatever. Um, I was immature and I didn't really understand what that meant. So I, after trying to have a conversation, I remember having, trying to ask her, what do you mean? What yeah. do you mean you don't? And she said, I'm not, quote, I'm not comfortable talking about this with you. Uh, so then it instantly feels like it's, she's not having sex with you. Well, she says, she says, I'm not comfortable talking about she's, this with you. Right, okay. And in my head, I go, well, if we can't talk about it, we can't solve it. Yeah. So this relationship's done. Right, okay. So I remember leaving, um, leaving that day and then there was a, about a year gap, we broke up and she flew to the other side of the world, lived in Bali for a year, got to understand herself a bit better. And I think as time went on, I, I reflected on that. I learned more about things and life and mm -hmm. sex and relationships. And I also, I think because, because she was such a special person, I realized that like she is, she is the one. She, was, she ticked all the boxes. I t I've described her earlier on about yeah. her values and stuff. So I thought, I'm, I'm gonna go there. I'm gonna fly to Bali. So I flew to Bali. And really I was on a mission just to say sorry. Right, okay. I went and said sorry to her. Being very classy and gracious as she always is, she said, you don't need to say sorry to me. Thank you, I understand. But that was it, she wasn't interested in me. Ah, okay. So I, it wasn't like she was like, oh, blah, blah. Like, you know, you think it happens yeah, in the movies. Yeah, yeah. And anyways, as, as the days went by, as I was in Bali, I was there for a couple of weeks. We were like, we'd meet each other every other day. She wasn't being romantic. She wasn't touching me. It wasn't, mm -hmm. it was, we were friends. Yeah. And then one day she turned to me and said, I've got to tell you something. Mm -hmm. Since we've been apart, I've been with someone else. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't easy for me to take. Now, yeah. old Steve shows up and he goes, let's play some games. Right, okay. New Steve had realized that it, that's old me. Okay. And so new me says, thank you for telling me. I appreciate that. Yeah. And doesn't hold any grudges and is super mature about it. The days went on. Again, we're still just friends. And then um, I realized I wasn't, I'd failed. I wasn't right. going to get her back. So send her a message saying, I've had an amazing time seeing you. I'm, I'm, thank you for being so gracious with me. I'm leaving tomorrow. But yeah, thank you. And she sent me a message, which really surprised me. She was like, oh, um, you're leaving. Mm. I was like, um, she's like, can I see you before, you, before I go? Yeah. Now old me shows up then and goes, say you, she can't see yeah, you before yeah, yeah. you go. Yeah, She's yeah, yeah. aired you this whole time. Yeah. Can take revenge here. Mm -hmm. New me says, of course you can see me before I go. Yeah. Now in those two days before I left, everything changed. Right, okay. And it's like life was testing me to see if I was still old Steve and if I was deserving mm -hmm. of better. Right, okay. Of the love that I, that I could have. Yeah. In order for me to get the love that I could have, I had to change. Right. I had to stop being immature. I had to be patient. I had to be understanding. And I, I was put through those tests. Mm -hmm. And then in those last days, everything changed. And I will marry her 100%. Everything changed. It was like we'd, it was like we'd fallen in love again. Right, okay. So, um, and we're still, we're still together now. She lives with me now and everything's changed. And there's another thing. Mm -hmm. It turns out it wasn't that she didn't like having sex. Yeah. It's that men and women often, sex is a language. Right. She was speaking Spanish. I was speaking... Yoruba, let's say. Yoruba, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And just that piece of information yeah. makes you think about sex entirely differently. Oh, absolutely. You go, oh, okay. So it's not that you don't, you don't speak, you just have a different language. So let me learn your language. Right, okay. And then, you know, we can communicate. Yeah. So... I thought I don't like having sex, and my, you know, of my closest six best friends, three of them have heard that from their partners. And I think it's worth listening to, right? And I like, even as someone who has such complications relationships with sex, and I think many people do, um, just for someone to hear that from you. Yeah. And that for the longest time, I wasn't having sex, and I was like, I was celibate. And every time I said it to men, I was dating, they were like, challenge accepted. Oh shh. <laughs> like as soon as I said it, like, oh, you, you wait. Yeah. And I think somehow a lot of men lean towards that. I think there was a belief that you believe that this thing is some sort of magical source. Ah, uh, the pleasure stick. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And don't want to break it to you guys. It's not always yeah. pleasurable. Yeah, because we, we learned what sex was from watching porn. Yeah. So we think it's this like smash and grab. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you learn about the primal nature of a woman, um, it tends to be the case, and I'm not speaking for all women, yeah. because um, some people like smash and grab, mm -hmm. that's all good. Some spe people speak that language. But there's another language to sex, which is a, a lot, from what I've seen anyway, seems to be a little bit more sensual, a bit more, a bit slower than yeah. 
than the the male smash and grab that mm -hmm. we see in porn. Yeah. A little bit less dominating all the time. I mean, some women love domi yeah. being dominated as well, but and so so do some men. But it's just about understanding there's nuance and it's a mo there's different languages. Mm -hmm. And so the question should be not like, did you like that? It's yeah. like, what is your language? Like, right, what do you exactly. like? Yeah. Like, what makes you feel X, Y, and Z? Yeah. Um, and then finding the bridge where we can speak that language together. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, all of the old stuff you mentioned, it feels very like toxic masculinity. And I really wanted to talk about that. And I think it would be a stupid conversation to talk about toxic masculinity with men without talking about how it interacts with women. Mm -hmm. I think as a black woman, the internet's probably the unsafest place I could ever be in. Yeah. I think it feels very say, it, unsafe. It doesn't feel like I'm cared for or looked after. And only people that seem to have my back in are other black women. Mm -hmm. And I think when we think of toxic being toxic and I care about if black men are toxic or not. I care about how we interact, especially when it's something for the world to see. I care about how black men interact with women when we're like, we're even not doing dirty laundry outside. These lot are watching us. Yeah. They're going to know if there's a race or we're going to lose them. We can't even chat to each other nicely. Yeah. <laughs> so like, how can we fix how that interaction happens and how can men drop being toxic and just kind of like maybe care a bit more when interacting with them? Maybe share the same vim that you share for everyone else or maybe don't share vim for that. It's just like, I, I should care here. I think, we, I think we've got to make respect cool. And I think mm. one of the great things is seeing role models of like black men that are acting, that are great husbands, fathers, mm -hmm. that are, you know, are faithful, that are honest, that have open conversations, that are emotional, that hold their hands up when they're wrong. And I think that when you see that in people that we admire in sports or business, or whatever yeah. else it is, it makes that cool. It makes that the thing. And we're moving away from an era of like getting our romance lessons from music videos. Yeah, absolutely. But even thing. outside of romance, well, I think it's easy yeah. to be nice to someone you're attracted to. That's easy. It's great to be polite and respectful to a woman that you find attractive. Yeah. And also, like, I hate the notion of that. That could be your sister. That could be your mother. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> like, respect mm. me outside of wanting to sleep with me or thinking I'm a family member. How do you show care outside of having to put me in those shoes? Um, how, do, how do I show care? Yeah. So it's, it's all about, for me, it's like the type of person you're going for. Mm -hmm. Because there's a certain type of person who thinks the way to, to lure you in yeah. is by being a little bit arrogant, yeah. maybe putting you down a little bit, mm -hmm. um, showing their material possessions and stuff. Yeah. And I tend to think in life, we kind of, we kind of attract um, what we are. Right, I think okay. we are very much a magnet. Mm -hmm. So I remember my, um, my hairdresser coming to my place when I was in LA. And him, you know, he was cutting my hair and he walks in, he's got this big like diamond chain on and he's dripping, he's head to toe in designer yeah. things. And he's telling me, he's like, my girl, man, she's just left me for this other dude. And I'm like, tell me the story. And he's like, oh, I met, I was like, where did you meet her? He's like, I met her in a, in a nightclub. She was on the table. She was on my table because I was a big spender. Yeah. Um, and, and that's how we got connected. Mm -hmm. And then she's now cheated on me with this other guy. And I said like, what did you like about her? Man, she was fire. She was hot. Didn't mention her character or personality yeah. thing. You got what you deserve, bro. Right. You got exactly what those shoes and that gold chain attracted. Yeah. And I think if we want to get different, we have to become different. Look at my story. Mm -hmm. Old Steve couldn't get her. Yeah. Old Steve got bad results. Mm -hmm. New Steve got the most unbelievable person ever. Right. Because I changed. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. I think it's. I think we're getting what we deserve a lot of the time in terms of we're a mirror and a magnet. Yeah. So. And that's a great thing because it means you can change it. Mm -hmm. It means that you can you can do the work inside here and the outside world changes. So if you don't change it, how do you think that shows up in relationships? Like how does toxic masculinity show up? Because I think there's still the notion of who wears the trousers. And I think yeah. that feels like a dated, quite a it is, yeah. toxic -y thing. I, when I think about the to toxic ma masculinity of you described it there, it's kind of like a lack of respect. Yeah. And that's... Um, that's not something that I've been exposed to. Like I said, even in even in the heat of the moments, my dad had the most unbelievable, unwavering respect for my mother. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's a respect thing. I think it's realizing that you're not better than anybody, regardless of like wealth, status, whatever, gender, yeah. whatever, um, and really living that. Okay, nice. I want to talk about preferences. Okay. And um, so I've got this thing that I don't think preference is just, it's just how I am. It's just what I like. I think it's so much deeper than that. I think it's how we grow up, who we were around, 100%. experiences, good or bad, who actually liked you, who desired you. 100%. And also, if we listen to my guy, Sigmund Freud, who our mother is. Like, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's so much bigger than just a, it's just how I am. 100%. I just wanted to 
talk to you about what you think preferences are and if you do think also it's a lot deeper than this, just this idea of it's just what I like. I think you've nailed it. I think it's a myriad of experiences we've had and how we've interpreted those situations and we don't even realise that we've learned those things. It's in the same way that you might like certain fruits or colours or yeah. football teams or because of your early experiences and the environments that you're in and the culture you're in and, and how you've emotionally attached yourself to that. I think the same thing with, with our preferences. Mm -hmm. they, they probably stem a lot deeper and a lot earlier than we expect. That we think it is, yeah. yeah. And I mean, you grew up in, like, like you said, you apart from your siblings, you were the only black person in your school. Mm. How did that work with people, how they looked at you, how women desired you? Because obviously there was this whole notion of like, black men and you guys are highly yeah. desired and you know, you come with all of these great things. Did you ever feel like, and also was it to your benefit? Swings and roundabouts. <laughs> you win some, you lose some, right? right okay. yeah. so, so obviously I've met people in my life that I, I think based on their, their date and track record, they're not interested in me because right. they, you know, they like the blonde hair and the blue eyes. Yeah. And that's fine, you know, every, mm -hmm. each to their own. And then I've met people in my life where I look at their track record and every single partner they've had is a black man or looks like me, you know? So Do you date that kind of person? I don't think about it. It's more about, right, like, okay. do, am I interested in them? Okay, so there's so, no part of you that feels like they're here because I'm a black man. Mm, and like your creme de la creme of a black, you're successful, mm. you're this, you're that, Thank do you know you. what that's I mean? Kind. Like, so it's like, do you think that's the reason? Not that that's the sole reason, but I do think, I think black men often don't want to admit being fetishized. I think they're like, no, it's because I'm the guy. <laughs> 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 but I think there was like other reasons outside of that. Um, it's not, it's not my primary concern. Right, my okay. primary concern is like, do we have an attachment? Okay. And is that a genuine, authentic, deep connection that we have? Right, okay. If everyone else you've dated looks exactly like me, yeah. I would assume that, that that's who you're attracted to. And that's great for me because that means you're probably attracted to me. And that's a good thing if I'm attracted to you. I'm not a big, I'm not big on like preferences. Yeah. I've dated every type of person from every type of place. Mm -hmm. So... That always seems to be, it seems to be a secondary thing. Right, okay. What they look like or what colour they are, what race they are. I've dated everything. Right, okay. So, and I've flipped between and the middle and the, you know, so it doesn't seem to matter to me. Matter to you, right, okay. Yeah. Okay, so you told the very romantic story of going to Bali and getting your partner back. Yeah. What's the most romantic thing someone's done for you? <sighs> it would just, it would be, going back to my love language, it would be the tiniest things. Okay. It would be doing something thoughtful. It would be... Give me an example. Gosh, that's an interesting question. It's on my birthday, my girlfriend gave me a, a scrapbook. Mm -hmm. And those things, it sounds like it's strange, but those things mean more to me than anything else someone could do for yeah. me. Some, for someone to take the time and for it to be meaningful. There's nothing you can buy me that would make me go, oh my God. Mm -hmm. even, with my, even with my team, like the things that matter the most to me are small, thoughtful gestures yeah. of... You know, I went and saw this play a year ago and I loved it and mm -hmm. they got me like a signed postcard. That kind of thing. Thoughtfulness, I think, is romance for me. Right, okay. Nothing I like else. See, the scrapbook idea, I feel like that's something I would think would be a nice gift, but I think men wouldn't like it. This man likes it. Right, okay. But you're so, also the man that can buy yourself whatever you want. So but I'm also going to make you, if we're dating, I'm, I'm also going to make you a scrapbook. I made right, okay. my girlfriend... I, had this hotel room in Paris, which she was coming into. She didn't even know we were going to that place. I stayed, stayed up all night in Berlin making the scrap, but getting the photos, print sticking with the little love hearts and everything. Got there, got the, fifth, the 100 roses in the bedroom and she arrived, gave her the scrapbook. Mm -hmm. And that was for Valentine's Day. I didn't buy her like a Chanel this way. She doesn't yeah. care. So, but the scrapbook, she sat there and she read every page. And it was our journey as a couple from when we first met to, to today. So that's, that for me is love. It's not... Yeah, that's and we also don't post on social media, so okay. the only time someone like got a photo of us together was when the Daily Mail followed me down the street, and they, <laughs> when we were leaving the gym, they took some photos and put it in the paper. But right, okay. other than that, you'd never see us online together. Okay, would, and that's on purpose. One hundred percent. Okay, and that's just for her. She doesn't even. See not even for kind of her. Not even for her. It's for who cares? It's not got a lot of followers on Instagram. Two point one million followers. It's not their business. Yeah, absolutely. And ultimately, yeah. like, that's not what they're there for. Then I hope not. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so it's not I try and keep for. it yeah. super private. On yeah. my podcast now, I talk about it a lot in context, but no, I don't share photos, nothing. Holidays, nothing, nothing. You're never getting anything. If we have the, if we get married, if I have a baby, you're not seeing my baby on LinkedIn like some people are doing I these days. Agree you know with what that. I mean? Yeah, yeah. Don't absolutely. be putting your baby on LinkedIn. And is marriage so, something in the cards for you? 100%. With your partner? Okay. I'm just not bothered about marriage. So okay. if she wants to do it, fine. But right, for okay. me, it's, it doesn't matter. Would it be like a huge elaborate engagement? It would be really creative and musical and probably on a hill in Kenya. 
it would be oh, like I'd see it as a project to design creatively. Right, okay. And I think I'd probably end up taking the lead on it, to be honest. Do you find, because you, you're quite creative when it comes to romance, just because you have a partner who, because like buying gifts is quite easy. Like it's very yeah. easy if you had a partner that yeah, likes so to design stuff, it's right? You can, just, you can just see what's cool yeah. and then you buy it for them. But because you have a partner that doesn't require that, yeah. you kind of have to be creative when it's, you're being it romantic. It takes a lot longer. Yeah. You know, we, yeah, we make like a Google sheet, me and my assistant, we'll make a Google sheet yeah. of things that she might have said in the last six months, some crystal, some That's stone, adorable. some like playing card deck from, like, and it's all trinkety thoughtfulness, mm -hmm. which takes a long time. And then like her favorite thing is a sunflower. So can we get a sunflower in August? And you know, it's that kind of thing. Like one sunflower, you know, very thoughtful. Oh, and you are trying to keep but I, I love that like, every way. I remember making this website on her birthday called happybirthdayhername.com. Yeah. She goes to it and it's this journey and she gets to decide left or right. And as she goes through the pages, there's writing coming down and I'm typing. She can see me typing words. And then she's at the end of this like website journey where she's put, she's put her headphones on. She's got a choice. And based on which button she clicks, mm -hmm. it, it books the date. So she clicked this oh, button on the right okay. and it booked, it said, you're going to be picked up next Friday at 7 oh. p.m. And it booked us to go to this place and then to go on holiday yeah. to this certain place. And she, so I like the creativity of it, you know, because I think that says more, right? It's it more says a lot more. So. Please take tips. Yeah. Like, <laughs> would you please take yeah. tips? It says so much. That's adorable. Would you like that though? Or would you like? I would absolutely love that. Yeah. I like, I would love like a mixtape. Like, yeah, okay. as in, like, I, yeah, yeah. I think things like that is adorable. I'm really into, like, a romance that's personalised. Mm -hmm. I think other things are very easy. Yeah. Or would you like, you know, something material? Would you like a... <laughs> no, 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 no. Like, ask me again and I'll fix my face. Go. <laughs> no, just keep it real. Do you know what? No. What would you like? If I it was would your... actually prefer effort. Genuinely, I would Christmas prefer Christmas coming up. What would I get you? What would you get me for Christmas? Okay, so it can be a nice gift, right? Something I can open and it's like, okay, this is nice. But also, like, it can be something that feels like, especially with Christmas, it feels like you're committing to future Christmases. Incense? No. <laughs> <laughs> not incense, not candles. But let's say, like, a bauble of Christmas tree. So it's you're committing to other Christmases with us. Or you buy Ooh, me, like, an angel for the top of the tree, that which is that like, I'm committing to knowing that, that's like, interesting, I'm going to see this every other year. That feels, like, nice for me. That's interesting. Right? That's cute. You want, you want reassurance? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I've um, got one last question for you. So sure. I, like I said earlier, my love is home. What is your love? My love, oh gosh, I would say the exact same thing. I'd say it was home. That's how I feel about it. That's how I describe it all the time to people. Mm -hmm. It's that feeling of like, this is, this is base camp. Yeah. This is where we set off every day from. This is the safest place to be. It's the, it's the place you're understood without having to explain yourself where you can't lie because, you know, it's the purest, most honest, um, yeah, base camp of your life. Like I kind of see, see myself as like an astronaut that's kind of taking off from this place every day and then coming, coming back. And that's what my relationship is. It's the foundation. It's teamwork. It's all of those things. Nice. Yeah, it's, you should be, like I, someone said to me one day, like love is when you make the other pers person better because of your mutual presence. And I kind of think about that. It's like a two-way thing. I'm going to pour into you, you're going to pour into me, and together we'll, we'll be full. So that's kind of how I think about it. And I get just as much from in my relationship as from helping her do stuff. In fact, I get more of a buzz when, when her things yeah, like yeah, do well and help professional yeah. stuff and showing up and, you know, I, she does this, these breathwork sessions and she was doing some in London and me just sneaking in the back door and watching. Don't you love being a fan of your partner? Oh my God. Like, she's like more fun of a yeah. banner, like, yeah. Because she comes to my stuff, she comes to my shows and she came to my tour and stuff. And so for me to get to be a yeah. cheerleader mm -hmm. and for it to be about her is, is the best. Thank you so much yeah. for this chat. Thank you for having me, thank you're amazing. Thank you very much, and so are you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. That was a great conversation. I feel like we went everywhere, here, there and everywhere. Yeah. Do you feel more open, more vulnerable with me now? I do, I shared some things I've not shared before, so. Oh, oh yes, they're getting exclusive. Thought. You've got loads of exclusives. Oh, come so, yeah. on. <laughs> um, so let me know when you want to write that story. Yay, <laughs> I will I'm do. here, and you guys let yeah. me know your thoughts as well, and um, what you thought about the conversation, what you learned from Stephen, using the hashtag MyLoveIs. I'll be back with you next week. Thank you very much, you've been amazing. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.